now start recording this session. Hello, everybody. I'm a Dynamics 365 MVP, Rick McCutcheon, and I'm here today with an outstanding panel, and we're going to have a discussion on user adoption strategies for Dynamics 365 CE, CRM, and the Power Platform. So let's go to our panelists, and they can introduce themselves. Kylie, we'll start with you. Sure, thanks Rick. I'm Kylie Kaiser. I'm also a business applications MVP and I am a solution architect at Hitachi Solutions. I've been working with Dynamics 365 or CRM, whatever we want to call it, for about 10 years now. Okay, fantastic. Neil. Hi Rick, hi everybody. My name is Neil Benson. I live in Brisbane, Queensland, Australia, originally from Northern Ireland, but uh, been working with I guess Microsoft Dynamics CRM since 2006, uh, using the Scrum framework since 2008, been an MVP since 2010, and most importantly, the thing I'm most proud of, I've owned my own pizza oven since 2020. Um, and, uh, <laughs> I've got one too uh, now, so they're great. They're great. I, uh, I, I'm on a mission to help Microsoft customers and partners use the Scrum framework and agile approaches to build amazing business applications. And I do that through my online training courses, my coaching, consulting, and through my podcast. Thank you, Neil. Heidi. Hi, I'm Heidi Neuhauser. I work for Reenhanced. We are a Dynamics 365 and Power Platform partner. I've been working with Microsoft CRM and Dynamics 365 since 2010. And I've been on the customer side for six or seven years and the partner side for the last four years. So thanks for having me join the panel. I'm super passionate about user adoption and I'm happy to be here with you guys. Thanks, Heidi. Uh, Mark. Thank you very much. Yeah, I am representing ClickLearn. Uh, I am the partner channel manager here in ClickLearn. I am responsible for our partner programs. So how we handle uh, new partners, enabling them, and of course, help them to deliver uh, and accelerate uh, user adoptions, creating documentation and training. I've also been working with Microsoft partners for the last 10 years. So uh, yeah, uh, I have been mainly on uh, the CE. Of course, the Power Platform is something new, uh, but uh, also for, for FNO and, and Business Central. Okay, thank you, Mark. Now, you know, when we put this group of panelists together, I was very excited because, you know, we all know each other through the user group community and we're all very strong advocates of, you know, user adoption. So, you know, I don't think I've talked to many of these uh, folks in the last year, so let's kind of get caught up on things. How was the uh, last year of working through the pandemic remotely, you know, affecting the way, you know, we deliver projects today? And why don't we start with Heidi? Yeah, that's a really good question. It's changed an awful lot. A lot of what we did was hands-on with our customer. We would try to be there in person for requirements gathering sessions, everything from the very beginning of the project to obviously your go live and you want to be there in person to support your users as much as you possibly can. So this was a fun practice and change management for all of us as partners to kind of take how we do things and change it and, and make sure that we're still delivering the same level and quality as we were in person. So it's been really a, a big fun change for us. A lot of what we're delivering has been on Teams and we are on camera like this all the time, even when you don't want to, because the number one thing we can do is still be present with our customers and it means a lot to still have a visual connection with somebody. And I know we all understand people learn differently. Some people, this change is wonderful. The people who work really well with webinars and online media and on-demand video content, this has probably been great for them. But others of us who are kind of more hands-on kinesthetic learners, this has been a challenge. So we try to always keep in mind I think I'm going on a tangent in your question, but I'll come back around. So <laughs> we try to keep in mind how, how everybody learns and everybody learns differently and everybody needs to consume data differently. And, and we try to do that again by turning on our video. We try to you know, have documentation for everything. So we'll talk about stuff, we'll record our conversations, we'll write emails and write up project plans, send it in writing so people can review have video content, again, just really trying to diversify 
the way we're reaching out to people because obviously in person hasn't been much of an option in the last year. Okay, thanks, Heidi. Neil, over to you. So I'm um, thinking about this time last year, Rick, I was uh, in the middle of a project for a local client here called the Royal Automobile Club of Queensland. They provide financial services to auto club members. I'd been there for about a year and a half last March. I'd just come back from Scottish Summit in Glasgow. I'd flown there for the weekend, come back to Brisbane. I was looking forward to seeing you at MVP Summit two weeks later, and RACQ sent our project team. In fact, they sent the entire IT department home. And within, that was a kind of a trial. Let's see how homeworking works out because we might need to send our business teams home as well. And sure enough, two weeks later, the entire organization was sent home. So 1,500 people across multiple branches across our state all sent home. And my project team had to immediately transition into working remotely. Like Heidi said, over Teams, that was a big transition for us. We had been working in person as a like set of scrum teams for 18 months at that stage. And now suddenly we're remote, we're having to learn new collaboration tools. God bless Microsoft, Teams doesn't suck as much as it used to. It's got a lot better. And so that's become less painful, um, but there's still like, a ways to go. Your remote working for me will never replace in-person team collaboration. So I'm looking forward to getting back there. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, we had a heck of a time transitioning over. Okay, Kylie. Yeah, I think things were a little different for me because last year I had already been working remotely at that point for a year and most of my team had already been remote for at least six months. They had just, because of how the office structure was, we had to kind of determine that the whole team was remote. So our team working remote, there wasn't an adjustment but we were adjusting to business users learning to work remote. And so like what Heidi was saying about different learning styles, I think what's really great in person is you can have something for everyone's learning style all at once. But when you're remote, you just, you can't, you're kind of a li little bit more limited. And I think the other thing we've all been dealing with is, uh, distractions around us, right? I think for me, my husband formerly went to the office and I had all my own space. And then now he's working at home and, you know, wants to like talk and I'm like, what's happening, you know? And so, but everybody's dealing with that. There's always kids. I think I'm surprised Heidi's cat hasn't walked by the camera yet, right? <laughs> Sitting right there, all these things. And I think we, how we've planned all of our user adoption in the past is like, well, we'll do a one day in-person training, we'll serve lunch, that'll make people come, right? But now we can't, we're not sending people food, we're not, and I don't think we can even rely on getting people for a four hour block or whatever. And so it's just kind of had to rework how we think of things, make it digestible chunks and make it quick and um, just plan for all these unexpected things. Um, I think the other big adjustment for me or big interesting thing for me is that I changed roles and moved into a partner consulting role. So then it's learning new people and new procedures and all this stuff all remotely, which is which is always a challenge. And but I think what's exciting for me is that I think when we look to the future, I think we're going to be seeing a lot less travel from the partner side, which is something I'm excited about. I mean, I like to travel, but I don't want to be gone all the time. So I think it's going to be interesting to see what of the tools and things that we've used over this last year, how many of those we can kind of stick with for the long term. I think what that balance looks like will be really interesting. Thanks, Kelly. Um, and Mark, anything from the click learn side of things, you know, what changes have you seen in your customers and partners over the last 12 months? So, uh, yeah, one thing is uh, working remotely. Uh, I would say from a click learn perspective, it's always been a thing that we always wanted to achieve. Uh, we've always been an online organization uh, since we are uh, trying to uh, accelerate use adoption, uh, onboarding people faster and easier and having them also on working on remote areas uh, with the right uh, training and onboarding materials. But but the challenge, if, if we look at also what ClickLearn has been through, uh, we have generated from the customer's perspective a lot of leads through um, these uh, Microsoft conferences. So not being able to travel out there and not being able to actually talk face to face with clients and having the end users or the customers to adapt into this daily routine of 
now we're going to have everything online and and not having met them for the first time uh, and actually also that like today we have to uh, stop using this ourselves and creating these webinars to be able to actually get out there because we, we, we're not going to see each other uh, and I think for a, a longer time or period as well uh, before we really can start opening up travel uh, and, and this will continue afterwards as well because I think uh, we here on KickLearn have also realized what we're actually capable of doing uh, in terms of setting up these webinars, how many attendees we can actually have and how we can uh, become better in, in marketing and onboarding from a remote area as well. Okay, thank you, Mark. Um, so earlier we had a, a panel of ERP specialists on, and part of the conversation was really interesting because, you know, we started talking about, you know, doing discovery. So when we look at a, a successful project, you know, I think there's, you know, we can break it into a third. A third needs to be discovering specifications, a third building, and a third actually deploying in user adoption. The user adoption is important right across because if you don't get the discovery right, the user adoption. Um, doesn't work. But what was interesting, one of the gentlemen said that instead of doing an eight-hour discovery workshop, you now do a one-hour discovery call. And I'm thinking that that's better, right? Because you remember flying in somewhere and after lunch, everybody coming back after five hours of discovery, I think it kind of went down a little bit, right? So let's think about user adoption, how it's changed around discovery, building systems, and deploying systems. What are we doing differently now, and is it better? Heidi, would you like to go first? Sure. Um, I've actually noticed it's more challenging to get end users in, in the requirements room when it's remote, and I don't know if the rest of you have seen that, but it, it's very easy to get management involved. It always is. Uh, but it's it's really difficult to convince them that they need to have their users involved in that requirement some way or another. And I also prefer to have user groups with a variety of skill level with technology. Um, so in a perfect environment, in a perfect requirements meeting, I want that stick in the mud person in the room with me. I want to know why he or she doesn't like the system, doesn't like the idea of it. Is it a big brother issue or is it something else? Um, and I have not been successful in getting that person to the table in the remote world. So there are absolutely challenges. And again, I don't know if that's unique to me or if the rest of you are seeing this as well. Um, I wish I, I had a better way of getting my end users in the virtual room with me as well. I feel like they're they're kind of more protected now because their time is better spent on something else and I can't really get them in there. Hey, Kylie, would you like to add anything? Yeah, I think I completely agree with that. And I think we always, we want that person who's not technically savvy to tell us what things are not going well. But if they're not technically savvy, then Maybe they can't get into our team meeting or our virtual meeting. Maybe they don't know how to come off of mute or maybe they're not comfortable speaking, right? And I think that's kind of, that's what's really gonna be a struggle is dealing with different levels of participation in these meetings. So I think something that we've been struggling with is kind of doing, um, we're doing our, we're agile. So I'm sure Neil has so many things to say about that. But and we're having our sprint reviews and we're like just showing our functionality and we're like, give us some feedback, SME team. And then, you know, it's quiet because people don't have to speak up or we're asking for like, fill out these forms, send in your bugs this way, send in stuff from your testing. And it's just kind of cricket. So I think that's where we're really struggling, where when we get to um, releasing these features, we're we're going to find out, are they what you need? Like, And I think what we have to think about now is how can we actually be measuring that user adoption? Um, because formally, I think in the past, we would be, you'd walk around and you could help and see people using it and make sure that you're there to push them to do it the first few days. But if it's all remote, we really need to be able to say, okay, well, who actually went in there? Who hasn't been in there? And how do we give their managers the tools to help them succeed? Um, I think the other the other interesting thing is I think we have, I guess it's kind of related, but a lack of 
it's easier for people to not take ownership, right? A lack of ownership of their knowledge and of who's going to be doing that training and things like that. So I think we could do all of these great sprint reviews and then someone's like, hey, but how do I use the system? And you're like, well, don't didn't we just have like 10 hours of recorded sessions over the last 10 weeks or something like is this not what you need or what you know what do we need to give you that first step and so i think there was kind of a point where we're like well let's start again and we need to redo some stuff you've done before and i think it's just i think it's easy it's easier remotely not to take ownership in your own learning or in who should be responsible for training. I think there's a lot of those topics that people don't necessarily want to talk about that if you're in person, you'll bring up and you'll talk about it. But when you're remotely, if it never gets brought up, then you kind of get a swirling behavior of trying to figure out who should be doing what. And I think that that's I think we're going to need to work on more proactive communication around those things and just making sure that like you said, um, Rick, that are uh, that we're thinking about user adoption throughout the whole process, not just kind of tacking it on at the end and wondering what happened, right? Okay, Neil, would you like to add anything? Uh, sure, thanks, Rick. I think you're absolutely right. There's about an equal split of effort between the requirements piece, the development piece, and the deployment piece. But what I try and do in my agile approach is, is not to split them up that way. We're constantly doing requirements analysis. We're always building and we're frequently deploying. So they're not like three phases in a project. Um, we have subject matter experts, like Kylie said, and I, I love it when subject matter experts are dedicated to our project. So they are you know, taken out of their day-to-day -day business role and seconded onto our project team full time if possible. That's, that's the gold standard, but we, we don't always get there. And so we can schedule requirements workshops with those people like an hour a day or two hours a day if we have to. Sometimes it's high level, very future stuff, things that we're gonna be developing maybe next quarter. Other workshops are a bit more detailed, things we're gonna be developing in the next sprint or two. And then they're also there in the sprint reviews to review what we've built. And, and some things I think are harder and some things are easier. I'll give you an example of something that's easier today than it was maybe a year ago. And that's doing ride alongs. Like, I'd like to see what you do in your job today. People are much more comfortable screen sharing, talking through some of the customer interactions they've had and how they've used the existing system. And then right alongs at the other end, when you've deployed your new system and your new functionality and you wanna see how people are using it, you can have them either record their screen and share it with you, or you can you know, open up a Teams meeting and ask them questions as they walk through the system and that you can record that and then share it with your teams as well. So there are a couple of things that are easier, which is really good as well. Okay, thanks, Neil. Uh, Neil, let's talk about remote learning uh, because you're a, you're a specialist in this world with uh, the work you do at uh, Customary. So what have you learned and how, what changes have you seen in the way people are learning remotely? I'll give you two contrasting experiences with a big project that I finished up at the end of last year, we had hired five trainers. We had a content team recording videos in Adobe Captivate, and we were planning to send the trainers out to physical locations to train 1,500 people in a couple of weeks. These were shift workers and frontline customer workers, so a really tight schedule to try and get them all trained as close to possible as go live. And then, you know, bitter experience says, don't record stuff in Adobe Captivate months before your training because that's when all the bugs are getting fixed and the screens change and it's hard and expensive to re-record those videos. And planning to deliver Wait, lots of live in person. If you used Click Learn, you wouldn't have had that problem, but go well, ahead. Well, that's what I'm saying. It's it's a lesson learned, right? So um, <laughs> it was, this is hard not to do it, folks. Also, you know, Five in-person trainers is a very expensive way to do it. It's a great learning experience. You get all your questions answered by an expert in the system. But when we had to suddenly pivot and have all those trainers deliver online learning classes, it was a new experience for the trainers and a completely new experience for the, for the students as well, for all the users. Um, contrast that with, I think a lot of the professionals we're seeing in our world, in the Bit Power Platform and Dynamics 365 world, it's a huge number of people turning to online learning for their Microsoft certifications, for their Scrum certifications. And it's great to see people being able to take exams online where before you had to go to a test center in person, show your ID, 
now you can get remote proctored and, and have all that experience online. So two contrasting experiences there in, in the, the shifting world of, of online learning. Heidi, is there anything you're seeing from the, you know, the learning perspective that's sort of changing and is probably going to stay with us? Yeah, I, before the COVID pandemic, um, like Neil said, most people that we worked with would prefer in-person learning. I mean, it's, like you said, the gold standard. It, it's a really great learning experience. You can reach people. You can see when they're struggling and intervene where you need to. And obviously that is no longer possible. And we'd always recommend having some sort of online learning available. A lot of times people have a very large geographic spread of their customer, of their employees, and it's not always feasible to get everybody in a room together for in-person learning. So that was always a part of most of our plans, but it was like the supplementary part, not the main part. And in the last year, I mean, there's been obviously a massive shift where now all of our, almost all of our deliveries have been online and it's small digestible chunks. Um, there, I've seen people do functional based training, like here's the account table, here are the fields, these are those. And the real win there is to do kind of use case training scenarios. So group it by user type, how are people using the system, and speak to them in a language that makes sense. Now that was true in person too, but it's even more true now that everything's remote. Nobody really wants to sit there and get an eight hour training of a functional scenario, right? Here are your tables, go X, Y, Z. Let's look at all of the fields you have. If you can really take them through the journey based on how they're gonna use the system, it's gonna end better for everybody involved. Okay, thank you. So Kylie, you know, I know you use ClickLearn quite a bit in the past around sort of training and you had a lot of remote users. So, you know, what did you learn training uh, users that were not in front of you all the time? For sure, yeah. And I think I think some of the things that apply to ClickLearn apply with all of our trainings and it's kind of like what Heidi's saying, right? Make sure we're breaking this down into digestible chunks that are focused on one process. and. I think what I've really noticed through all of this is I think that our uh, your in-person strategies and your remote strategies have to be different. And I think that's difficult for people to um, comprehend at first. We wanna just say, okay, we'll just put it online and it will be fine. But I think what we really focused on using ClickLearn at um, a customer I was with previously is making small, short videos, right? We wanna say, okay, we wanna do this process and it's gonna take five steps and we'll lay it out and that will make a beautiful click learn step by step and video and it'll be great. And then if we need to show more about this process, let's create that separately, right? And I think the benefit of that is it's so much easier to say, hey guys, go in here and watch these five two minute trainings instead of saying, um, instead of saying that we need a, we need them to sit down and watch a whole hour long video or something like that. So I think that that's what's been really helpful. And we had, we really, um, we really enjoyed using ClickLearn. I think we had two dedicated people authoring content. And I say dedicated because they were dedicated to our Dynamics team, but they were also working as administrators and doing other functionality. So ClickLearn wasn't the main part of their function, um, but they were able to deliver in something like six months, we delivered 90 to 100 different trainings that for our team. And so I think how what we were able to do is make those small, provide recommendations and then say, these are you know the 10 that are required for you, but we have 25 others that if you need them are available for you to look at. And oh, if you wanna search, you might find other content that we've created for new functionality. And like we've talked about with delivering things iteratively, what we could do is include this as a part of our process is so we could, um, in in our sprint we're working on a new feature to like add email signatures something like that and we could say as part of this feature we want to deliver that click learn content to release at the same time so i think that was something that was really helpful 
for us and make it a part of our promotion strategy of the new features like, hey, your click learn is already there. Um, so that that training is just proactive and ready for people and ready for people to jump in there and start learning right away. And when you have, that, Kylie. go ahead. Sorry, Neil. Well, I love that, Kylie. It sounds like your team has baked, you know, updating the learning content as part of their definition of done. So, you know, a product backlog item isn't complete until the learning material is available for our users. That's, that's amazing. Yeah, for sure. I think it was really helpful. I think, you know, there's a few different things in this role. There's a few different things we were working on. We had some bigger projects that we had whole chunks of functionality we're delivering, right? And so with those, we would have separate, um, separate PBIs, separate stories, whatever we want to call them for training for this new user role, right? And then, but then there'd be other functionality that we're delivering for all the users that we could say, hey, this is a small change. So let's include training right in there, like in the definition of done, like you're talking about. So it was really great and able to get it more. I think it was important for our team to think of training first and to include that as part of the item and part of the work. So. And when you've created this many videos with Click Learn and you have to update things, what was the advantage? Yeah, yeah. So you kind of hinted to it earlier, Rick, but ClickLearn has this really cool replay functionality. So if I create my form one way and I record the training and it's beautiful, and then someone says, hey, I need these three extra fields. So those fields, maybe they don't interfere with the process, but they do change the screen. And you know how we all know how users can get very confused with uh, this screenshot doesn't match what I'm seeing. Even if the important bits are still there, I think it can cause a lot of confusion, right? So what I could do is go into Click Learn and just replay my training and it would re-record and take new screenshots to update the training without me needing to do any extra work. And um, in this role, how it was really beneficial is we had separate model-driven apps for different groups, right? So I could have two teams who are both using accounts, but their forms look a little bit different and they might change a little bit of the terminology, right? So I record it for one group and then when I launch with the other group, I could just replay that create an account training. And instead of taking two hours to do all the polish and make it beautiful, it takes me half an hour, right? To just rebuild it and make it quick and easy for them. So I think that was one of the big time savers for us with Click Learn. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mark, is there anything you'd like to add around uh, how partners and customers are are leveraging some of the new features even in Click Learn um, for the remote learners? No, I definitely, I think we've touched based on, on a lot of these things, right? It's a lot about user acceptance testing. Like we can actually sit remotely uh, supporting it from, from Click Learn that we, instead of just opening up saying to client, hey, system is ready, let's go live. Um, there can be made a lot of errors. It can cost a lot of money, depending on what, what your processes are. And that we are actually able to deliver this and, and actually uh, measure it as well and deliver data on it and make sure that people actually perform before we open up for a live system. I see partners as really beneficial for them, but of course also for the customer when they are implementing new applications as well. Um, and I think Kylie just based on it a lot of the world uh, that we are helping customers and partners to always make your uh, documentation uh, um, updated, right? It's always compliant. It's always on the latest version. I know even on the Power Platform, right? How many releases have there not been on the Power Platform? How many times have they not moved the button or changed something? So as you just mentioned before, if the picture is not correct, then it's not there. So being able to keep this updated and consistent, it's really what we, we, we want to uh, achieve here at Kickman. And, and less and not least, but we can talk a lot about this as well, Microsoft is also going out and saying to partners, like we need to improve user adoptions. We need to improve the users to being able to actually uh, adapt our system in the best possible way. Um, and that's really what we are trying to, to achieve as well here, to help partners with that and clients, of course. You know, we can see that with Microsoft hiring customer success managers. Like you know, three years ago, I don't think there was a customer success manager. Now, if you go into LinkedIn and look up customer success managers under Microsoft, there's thousands. So 
Um, okay, I want to thank the panel, and let's just go around quickly talk about some of the changes we're having in Dynamics. You know, we've got this power platform, we've got a lot of new technology. What excites you about what's coming that's going to help with user adoption? Why don't we start with Neil? Uh, what's coming is going to help with user adoption. I think one thing would help if they just kept the names of things the same. You know what? That would be good. <laughs> that doesn't affect uh, the customers as much as the partners. Uh, perhaps, yeah. Uh, listen, there's a whole host of features coming on Microsoft's continually innovating, but there's also some some still some significant gaps. I think where you know partners like ClickLearn fill a, a great or play a great role. Things like customized online help. So you know Microsoft's never quite got there with their ambition in that area. I thank goodness we've got things like ClickLearn to fill that gap. Um, but there's, yeah, there's a whole host of features. I think there's a new functionality. One area I'd love to see improved is business process flows. I think they have so much untapped potential and the user interface for the new uh, unified uh, interface, the new unified client with business process flows isn't quite there yet. Um, but I think if we could just streamline those, that'd be a heck of a lot more useful for our users. So. Okay. That's my uh, that's my two cents. My vote for Microsoft Ideas. Thanks, Neil. Uh, Kylie, what would you like, Kylie? What would you like to see coming forward with uh, the new technology that helps with user adoption? Yeah, I think that. I mean, there's so many things. There's so much great stuff that's coming. I think a a big thing that we are seeing more of and using more of is just maybe a simple feature but like different model driven apps and having smaller power apps for specific functions i think in the past we always thought we have one way to work maybe we'll hide things with security but most of it is a training issue we'll just train them to do it correctly but i think now we're kind of shifting that focus to say let's only provide them a, a view into just what they need let's make purpose driven apps to help them to do one feature, which I think is gonna be really valuable. Um, and I think also what we need to focus on, or I maybe speaking for myself, what I need to focus on more is making sure things are mobile friendly and paying attention to like, I know there's new apps and updates coming out for those. I think that that's something that we just need to be aware of because more and more people are they're working from home, they're working while they're doing other things, not just people who have to go to a work site and use mobile functionality, but there's people who, you know, they're trying to take a call while they're also making breakfast, right? And they need to be able to get that access quickly on their mobile device. And so I think that's something we need to focus on and be aware of. Okay, thank you. Heidi, over to you. What do you see coming up that really excites you? Kylie stole my favorite, but I have a backup. Model-driven apps are really the number one quickest way to increase your user adoption. Configure something very simply using all out-of-the-box tools and deliver something that makes your user's life easier. It's streamlined, it's customized just for them. Um, but my second thing that I'm really excited about that I've been excited to learn more about is Power Automate, because now you can start to tap into the Power Platform and add on things beyond just the scope of traditional CRM. So things that users are doing in CRM can trigger different areas that aren't even close to CRM that maybe we could have dreamt about, but we need a developer to create a custom integration to kind of do that work. And now I, as a system administrator, can just simply configure it. So I think that's really exciting and it's something that those of us who wanna keep an eye on user adoption can start to leverage a little bit more to just extend the capabilities for our end users well beyond the scope of traditional CRM. Okay, thanks. Mark, let's wrap it up with you. Talk a little bit about you know, how partners can get involved with ClickLearn because I clearly believe every partner should be. Oh, and I clearly believe as well, Rick. So uh, no, uh, it's super easy to become a partner of ClickLearn. Like uh, we have a free partner program that everybody can join in the Microsoft Dynamics uh, practice. Um, so we are always taking in partners. Um, we have a full process of when we actually come in, how are we going to do the partner acquisitions, how are we going to enable you, how are we going to take care of customer service. Uh, we always say here, we, we are actually here to do the heavy lifting for you. It's a referral program where we can help you through uh, any of your leads, clients, etc. And at the same time, we train and educate you during that path if you want to, 
or you can simply let us handle everything. Um, it's really, really easy. You can go in on our website, you can reach out to us personally, uh, and, and you can simply just request a form, uh, and, and then you can become a partner in, in yeah, less than a second. Okay, Mark, thank you. I want to thank our panel for taking the time today, and I hope we can get together in the future to talk more about all things dynamics, business applications, power platform, and user adoption. Everybody, have a great day. Thanks, Thanks. Thank Thanks you very much. Good work, everyone. Excellent. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, I'm going to continue recording in case uh, some good quotes, etc. Everything comes up, but uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> you just. Uh, can you just stop recording? I got to ask them something. Okay. I'll stop. <laughs>